my name is Taryn McKenna, and I'll be moderating Signed, Sealed, and Delivered Hold Targeter Geolocation Follow Up with your presenter, Llewellyn Marshall of NC Cardinal. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors Equinox for the Feed Loop platform sponsorship, ECDI for the captioning, which I'll post the link to in just a moment, and Kipu for Thursday's Hackfest. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat. I'll be monitoring both the feed loop and the Zoom chat, so you can use either one. Uh, this session will be recorded. And again, I will post the captioning in the chat. With that, this is a short session, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Llewellyn. If I could figure out how to stop sharing. There we go. <laughs> hey, can everybody hear me? Yes. Cool. I wanted to start off by saying I didn't realize that we didn't have the background blurring, so I'm sorry about my messy home office here you all have to look at. I guarantee it looks better than mine. Okay, let's get rolling. Hey, everybody. My name is Llewellyn Marshall, and I'm an administrator and application developer for the State Library of North Carolina's NC Cardinal program. At the 2021 Evergreen Conference, I did a presentation about our ongoing project to integrate geolocation services into our whole targeter. We finished that project and we fully rolled it out across our consortium. So I'd like to go over some of the challenges we met during implementation and what changes we needed to make behind the scenes to address them. So first off, I wanted to give an overview of what NC Cardinal looks like and why geolocation is so important. NC Cardinal is a statewide consortium that operates in 64 of North Carolina's 100 counties, and the members include eight regional libraries, 37 county libraries, six municipal, and one special library. From the mountains to the sea, we serve folks across all economic and racial backgrounds. North Carolina's geography is just as diverse as its people. The Blue Ridge Mountains, Outer Banks, and Piedmont all have representation within NC Cardinal. For comparison, on the left is Cardinal's westernmost member in Murphy, compared to our easternmost member in Beaufort. As the crow flies, the distance between these two main library branches is 418 miles. That's almost 80% the width of the entire state. Given the ocean, mountains, rivers, and cities in the way, the driving distance between these two library systems is 510 miles. That has a minimum travel time of 8 hours and 21 minutes. With Stock Evergreen's randomized hole targeting method, a transit between these two systems was just as likely to happen as transits from 25 miles away. While this doesn't have a massive impact on the cost per transit, it's really only a few cents per package, it does have an impact on the time it can take for patrons to receive the items they put on hold. And it also has an environmental impact with the amount of emissions created and fuel expended. Over the years, we've had many staff members come to us with complaints that material is being sent hundreds of miles when it could have been sent dozens. Some staff members would even put their thumb on the scale to get materials to transit shorter distances. Throughout the last three years, we've worked on an update to Evergreen that would address this issue by implementing geolocation services that sort potential hold targets. By the beginning of 2024, we had deployed the code and enabled it for every system across our consortium. Because I went over this in detail during my 2021 presentation, I'll only give a broad overview of the implementation here. We started by assigning each system level org unit a branch that would act as its shipping hub. The shipping hub is the branch that packages arrive at before they're sent to their final destination within the library system. NC Cardinal is responsible for footing the bill of hub to hub transits, while the systems are responsible for internal transits. Shipping hubs are assigned on the org unit edit page. If the field is left blank, an org unit will inherit its shipping hub from its ancestor. Every shipping hub we added needed to have a valid mailing address with longitude and latitude in order for calculations to work. Once every single shipping hub had been set up, we were ready to create our shipping hub distances. Each shipping hub distance contains an origin hub, a destination hub, and the physical distance between those two locations. These can be entered in by hand for the masochistic among you, but it can also be automated using a third-party geolocation service. Currently, I've only implemented Bing since it's free to use. 
We submit our entire list of longitudes and latitudes to Bing, and they return the distance matrix containing the distance between each point. For unimplemented geolocation services, we use as the crow flies distances instead. After my 2021 presentation, I ran into an issue with Bing where there was a limit placed on how many pairs of coordinates could be compared at once. This limit was somewhere around 2,500. So to get around this, I break the list into smaller chunks and make a request for each. The end results are combined to make our total distance matrix. Another thing I added after my 2021 presentation was a library setting that enables or disables the geolocation feature as needed. While we were still in the early phases, we enabled this setting one library system at a time to monitor what happened. After a month of smooth sailing, we enabled it for the whole consortium. The hold copy map contains all of the potential copies for a hold request. And in the original targeter, these would be grouped by proximity and then selected randomly. But I added the shipping hub distance to the hold copy map so that it can be used to sort the list of potential copies with the shortest distances coming first. In the database, the shipping distances are retrieved using a trigger function the exact same way that proximity is retrieved. As we implemented our code, we ran into a few new challenges that we needed to overcome. Removing the randomness factor in the whole targeter exposed things that we hadn't considered. There was a lot more to think about than just raw distance between shipping hubs. Number one, how do we deal with shipping hubs that are a negligible distance away from a pickup library? Number two, how do we deal with shipping surcharges that carriers apply to certain zip codes? And number three, how do we deal with particular copies getting chosen over and over again because they're the closest for a hold? So what do I mean by negligible distance? Here's a real world example. Let's say we have a hold being picked up in Henderson County. There are two shipping hubs nearby to Hendersonville. Marshall is 43.8 miles north, while Rutherfordton is 38 and a half miles east. In the grand scheme of things, those five miles difference don't make enough of an impact to care about which shipping hub is chosen. We created the concept of a distance divisor. This is an amount of miles to divide all of our distances by to normalize them for comparison. With this, we're basically saying, I don't care about differences in distance smaller than this number. Let's use a divisor of 10 miles in this scenario. 38 and a half miles becomes 3.85, which is rounded up to four. 43.8 miles becomes 4.38, which is rounded down to four. Now we've ignored the difference in distance between these two shipping hubs and the whole targets are scored the same. As a final note, here's a cool picture of Marshall. Next, what is a shipping surcharge? Surcharges are often esoteric fees that are applied to shipments based on factors such as corrected address, dangerous goods, overweight packages, and most importantly, the area zip code. It totally makes sense that these logistical challenges would raise the cost of delivering a parcel, but it can be very difficult to figure out when a shipping surcharge will be applied. We've only been able to sort of reverse engineer it by looking over our invoices and looking for abnormalities that come up in the amount we've been charged. My conspiracy theory is that this is on purpose to stick folks with hidden fees. These surcharges can be enormous. A surcharge can easily end up being three times as much as regular delivery fees. We use FedEx, so I'll be using them as an example. Their list of surcharges is easily found in their online documentation. There are a huge number of fees and surcharges that can apply, but only a handful of them are relevant to NC Cardinal. These are DAS Commercial, DAS Extended, and DAS Remote Commercial. These fines are $395, $490, and $1425 per package. These fines apply no matter how close together the sender and recipient are. Due to the astronomical amount of money that remote surcharges represented, we needed to do whatever possible to disincentivize those transits. DAS stands for Delivery Area Surcharges. These are kind of funny because they only apply when the recipient address is within a list of zip codes that FedEx has deemed to be remote. On April 4th, we just so happened to have two packages with similar weights going opposite directions. These packages were traveling between Raleigh and Burnsville. Raleigh has no delivery area surcharge, while Burnsville has the costliest surcharge. 
that outgoing package had a cost of $5.48, while the incoming package had a cost of $20.72. That's 378% of the outgoing charge. These surcharges really only apply to our libraries in the mountains and coast because infrastructure in the urbanized core of the state has become fairly solid over the years as the area saw rapid development throughout the 1900s. Dirt roads became paved roads, ferries became bridges, and low-income neighborhoods became interstate highways. But in remote and economically disadvantaged places, development and infrastructure hasn't seen as rapid a pace. Many places still rely on those one-lane bridges, dirt roads, ferries, and switchbacks. All of these can pose challenges and dangers to delivery vehicles. That all factors into what FedEx considers remote. DAS can have a devastating effect on shipping costs within these remote communities. Geolocation could actually make this much worse. Here's a real world example at NC Cardinal. Amy Regional Library consists of Yancey, Mitchell, and Avery counties. Their neighboring county, Madison, is also part of our consortium. Both Madison and Amy have the $14.25 remote DAS charge applied any time material is delivered to them. That means if Amy and Madison were to trade, we'd get that $14.25 on delivery and then another $14.25 when it returns home. So that's $28.50 worth of just surcharges alone. When our whole targeter was using a random number generator, these types of transits would be rare. Once we turned on the geolocation hold targeter, it would happen absolutely any time one of the systems had material that the other wanted. So how did we fix this? We created proximity adjustments between the remote system and every other system in the consortium to reduce the chance that remote transits can happen. Proximity adjustments will put items from that system into another tier from the rest of the copies so that they'll only be evaluated after every single other copy has been looked at. After we implemented that, we found that local copies were also getting that plus two proximity applied. This could mean that holds wouldn't select local copies as we expect. So to fix this, we applied a negative two proximity adjustment when the item circ lib and hold pickup lib belong to that same remote system. We looked through our FedEx invoices and created proximity adjustments for each system that was afflicted by remote surcharges. The amount of items that needed to transit from Amy decreased heavily the moment we turned on the proximity adjustments in January of 2023. It was averaging between 600 and 700 transits per month, and now it's averaging between 400 and 500. Madison had a lot more data to come through since they had joined much earlier than Amy. It's natural for a resource sharing burden on a library to lighten as more systems are added, but you can see that in January of 2023, the average number of transits plummeted. It's now down to an average of between 200 and 300 transits per month. The next problem that we needed to get a handle on was scenarios where the same copies would be chosen over and over again, even when they've already been dismissed for a hold. When a hold targets a copy, a staff member at that library can select it from their pull list and retarget the hold so that their copy won't fulfill it. The hold's target gets cleared out, and the next time that the targeter runs, it can't reselect the previous target. With a large pool of potential copies and a random hold targeter, it's unlikely that this copy would be targeted again. But what if randomness was removed from the hold targeter? Let's imagine this hold request scenario where the closest library, Library A, has two copies of the requested item. There's another library with a copy farther away, Library B. When the hold request is created, the hold targeter selects the first available copy at the closest library. A circulator forces the hold to reset because she doesn't want the copy to be targeted. Since there's no longer any randomness in the system, the next available copy at that library is chosen. The original copy can't be chosen since the targeter had just looked at it. She doesn't want any of her library's copies targeted for this hold so she resets it again. Then the targeter reselects the original copy because it's no longer the last copy looked at for the hold. This will happen every time that she resets the hold. It will never target the copy at library B. What can we do to make sure that those two copies aren't evaluated again 
when there are other copies close by? The answer is more proximity adjustments. We can put the copies into another tier of proximity so that they won't be looked at again until all other copies are evaluated. But how do we know whether the targeter has looked at a copy or not? NC Cardinal's version of Evergreen has a special feature that allows us to see when and why a hold's target is reset. These can be flagged as either manual or automatic. For manual resets, we can apply a virtual proximity adjustment that will push the last target copy to the end of the hold copy map queue. This virtual proximity adjustment only exists within the hold targeter for this particular hold. After seven days, this virtual proximity adjustment is forgotten. This is a value that you can configure with a library setting. Let's reimagine our original example taking proximity into account. Library A and B are proximity four, while library C is at proximity five. The whole targeter starts by looking at A's copies. The circulator at library A reset the hold for both times that it targeted their copies. The whole targeter gives A's copies a virtual proximity adjustment that will make it equal to their original proximity plus the maximum proximity across all potential copies. So in this case, that maximum proximity was five and the original proximity was four. So the new proximity is nine. This means that everything at library B and library C must be looked at before library A's copies can be selected again. If library B's copy is skipped, it will be set to proximity level nine and library C's copy is targeted next. If library C's copy is skipped, it will get a virtual proximity adjustment that will put it into proximity level 10. So now we're back to looking at libraries A and B again. With this, the whole targeter has a fair shake at looking at all of the potential copies while also respecting staff members' decisions to skip a copy for a hold. After we had worked out all of these issues in our development server, the rollout to production was extremely smooth. The first system to get the new hold targeter was Farmville. Farmville is a fairly small community near the center of the state. We decided to choose the smaller systems first so we could mitigate the potential damage that messing up bigger systems would have. However, there were absolutely no issues and the results look positive right off the bat. The benefits were immediate when the new code was enabled in January. The average transit distance dropped from 145 miles to under 110. That's about a 25% decrease. The number of total miles traveled per month is trending downwards as well. The drop in December can be attributed to the winter holidays. Benjamin created this graph last month. It shows that since we've enabled geolocation, more holds than ever are selecting materials from their closest libraries. Before this code was enabled, the holds were more evenly distributed across the system due to the randomness factor of the old targeter. We need a lot more data to know for certain how the new whole targeter code is affecting our resource sharing. However, there are a few issues that we'd like to keep an eye on as things move forward. Right now, the only geolocation service that this works with is Bing. So I did this because Bing is free and it's easy enough to work with. As I mentioned earlier, um, if you're not using Bing, it will use as the crow flies distances instead. So I think it would be nice to extend this over to Google and OpenStreetMap. And I was also thinking that since we have Microsoft's API, it might be a good idea to look into the Apple Maps API as well. Next problem I thought of is what happens if a big system with lots of books and lots of neighbors keeps getting picked on for resource sharing holds. So this could easily happen to Buncombe because they're a very large library system located in the Western part of the state and that's where NC Cardinal's coverage is at the greatest. And they also have no fines with FedEx whatsoever. So with our current hold targeting method, this library is the best possible source of material. So how do we make sure that Buncombe isn't getting an unfair share of hold requests? We wouldn't want too much of their collection to be sent out at once. So I'm thinking that there ought to be some way to judge how many items are circulating outside of the system and factor that into the score that we give a hold target. The next problem I've thought of, libraries open and close at different hours and different days. 
but since Evergreen is open 24 seven, library patrons can place hold requests at any hour they wish. Of course, it's going to target their local library first, whether or not that library is closed. But what if no one is around to capture the copy for a hold? By default, Evergreen will reset the hold after 24 hours. That means if a patron's local library is closed on Saturday and a patron places a hold on Friday afternoon, it will have reset by Saturday afternoon. After that, it could select a much worse copy. We've had many cases of materials needing to transit across great distances because a hold target wasn't captured in time. So one solution we've thought of is, what if we could freeze the hold until a hold's pickup library was open, or if a sister library in that system was open? Until we've come up with something concrete, we've set our retarget interval to 36 hours to give staff members more time. The next problem, not all roads are created equal. Some roads are going to have higher speeds, more lanes, and less traffic. Here's a real world example. NC54 runs by a few of our libraries, including the library that NC Cardinal works out of. NC54, at least near Raleigh, it maxes out at 45 miles per hour and it's single lane in some places. It's technically a highway, but at rush hour, it might as well be a used car lot. Meanwhile, I-40, which runs past a great number of our libraries, goes up to 70 miles per hour and is six lanes in some places. Distance alone treats a mile on NC54 the same as it treats a mile on I-40. So how can we factor in travel time to our whole targeting algorithm? The next problem, FedEx changes their fees every single year. Zip codes are added and removed and fines are frequently increased. Over the course of one year, that remote DAS charge went from $4 to 14. So what can we do to keep ahead of these changes? I think that it might be worth it to create a tool that can take in that zip code list and create the database proximity adjustments accordingly. And here's the last problem I've thought of. With the recent destruction of I-695 in Baltimore, logistics across the entire Baltimore DC region are going to be significantly impacted for years to come. And although Baltimore's port may reopen within a year, the bridge itself could take a decade to rebuild. With this crucial piece of infrastructure destroyed, delivery trucks will have to be rerouted for up to 19 miles through a heavily trafficked urban area. So if an emergency like that were to happen in North Carolina, what could we do to adapt our resource sharing strategies? We're excited to see how these changes to the whole targeter will affect NC Cardinal's resource sharing as we continue collecting data and making adjustments as the year progresses. And before I go, I would like to open the floor for any questions that the audience might have. We've got about seven minutes, it looks like. So let's see, I'm scrolling through the chat here. It's yeah. being really weird for me. It keeps like jumping back up. Yeah, there's been some display issues. Um, I don't see any questions so far in either the Zoom. Oh, there's a question that just came in in the Zoom chat. I don't see anything in the feed loop chat. Are you able to see it? Uh, I saw it for one second, then it jumped back up. Oh, I can read it too if you want. Uh, from an individual library's perspective, there's also the reverse of the Buncombe problem. We had to suddenly make room for four times as many bins for materials transiting back from Henderson and Buncombe. I guess that wasn't actually a question. <laughs> it's good to think about. <laughs> okay, um, there's, so I do see a question uh, after that. Yes. Are you getting the data from FedEx or from Evergreen? So uh, we get our FedEx invoices and that's like the main source of information when it comes to crafting these new policies. Um, but for the charts that I showed in the presentation, most of that was from the database. I was looking at the um, hold transit copies, which is a pretty good uh, metric, but it's good to keep in mind that there's going to be several transits per uh, parcel. So it's not, not a perfect metric. There are also a couple of questions asking if uh, your work is up um, in Git or if it will be pushed to Evergreen Main. So um, all of this is on a collab branch with Blake in the working repository. And um, yeah, there's definitely like talk about making like a launchpad bug and, and getting other uh, voices in on this. My main concern is that it's so dependent on the hold reset reason stuff 
So I feel like that needs to be merged in first because getting just the geolocation and not the whole reset stuff means you're going to get into that like feedback loop problem where it just keeps selecting the same things over and over. That's a good point. Okay. If anybody else has asked a question that we've missed, please enter it again. And lots of good comments and thank yous. Okay, could the hold reset entries code be employed to, pre to prevent retargeting if the currently targeted copy is the only copy? Uh, no, uh, so it would push it into another proximity level, but since it's the only copy, it would just skip one, two, three, four, just go straight to that last uh, proximity level and search that copy again. Okay, one more minute for questions and then we'll turn it over to the next host. More thank yous. Oh, Blake has posted the link to a launchpad bug in the chat. And he said the hold reset stuff has a bug. That's the bug that he posted. I think. Yeah, that's been a super valuable tool. I, I feel like I use it every other day when I get help desk tickets about hold stuff. Yeah, we'll definitely be studying what you've done in Pines because um, we're our expenses have gone up. We use a courier, not FedEx, but uh, our expenses have still gone up like crazy as at the yeah. same time that delivery times are slowing down. Okay. It's I don't see any. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, Llewellyn. That was an excellent presentation. And thank you. with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kate for to be the next host.